Tap that subscribe button and keep it locked here to Secrets to a Free Mind show with your host, Melanie Parker, powered by Quality Girl. In this episode, we'll hear from a retiree from the federal government in the areas of workforce and community affairs on setting the captives free, living after lockup. Keep it locked. Welcome back. I'm Melanie Parker, founder of Quality Girl and your host of Secrets to a Free Mind Show, where we help you free your mind, move forward in life. Shout out to Mike Horn and Mike Like Poetry on Twitter for co-designing the cover art and composing the beats. In addition to listening to this podcast, be sure to tap the thumbs up icon, subscribe button and bell icon to love us, follow us and receive clips via Twitter on episodes. Let's welcome Eric Schuler. Hi, Eric. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Doing well. What about yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm safe. That's right. We are safe and whole. What a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you for letting me participate. Absolutely. So, who is Eric Schuler? Uh, Eric Schuler is a born and raised Washingtonian who has benefited from a two parent household. Uh, where my father uh, and mother worked very hard uh, to raise seven children and uh, attended the local elementary schools and uh, junior high schools and high schools. I came out of Coolidge High School. I was one of the first black uh, police officers they hired in Montgomery County back in the early 70s. Um, I, I did the law enforcement piece for a while. Um, I changed careers. I went into uh, staffing and I learned a lot when I was in staffing and it piqued my interest in uh, community and employment and workforce development. And that's how I got my start. Um, my last position was with uh, Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, CSOSA where I was brought on to manage and create a workforce development program for returning citizens to the District of Columbia from the federal penitentiaries around the country. Okay, very good. Now, typically our pain becomes our passion and platform. So was there an experience that was training ground for you? Well, through the staffing, uh, understanding what employers were looking for and individuals, uh, the knowledge, skills, abilities, training, certification. Um, and it gave me an insight uh, into uh, community. Mm -hmm. and, and because workforce development is all about community. Yes. Um, from the staffing experience, I had an opportunity to be hired by the, uh, it's an organization called ACS, Applied Computer Science. And uh, ACS had the contract at that point for welfare to work. And I went in as the operational manager for that. Uh, and it, it dawned on me uh, that I could merge uh, the information and knowledge that I had acquired from staffing with helping the unemployed, underemployed, and formerly incarcerated transition back into the workforce. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. And I like what you say. You merged the skills and also the need, basically. And I, I can tell you a unique situation is the District of Columbia because mm. we're not a manufacturing city. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't produce any product. Mm. 
for a thought-based job market. Good point. Um, there are no warehouses and, and factories um, and farms. That's right. Uh, as there is in most of the country. Um, so it presents a unique challenge for individuals, especially individuals who are formerly incarcerated. Mm, very good point. Now, what is the first step to identifying the root cause in a reformed person's behavior and attitude? Um, we, uh, we began looking at behavioral modification. Uh, behavioral modification, meaning uh, tapping into the individual thought process and trying to first understand their point of view and then substituting those misnomers with fact. Mm -hmm. um, the fact is, you, you, you know, a lot of times you'll have individuals that came to me that said, you know, I, I want a job. And I say, okay, what do you do? Uh, re response would be anything. I'll do anything, man. I just need a job. Well, that not helpful. That's not helpful for the individual. Right. Because it's a sign that they don't know what they need. Good point. And they need guidance. They need support. That's right. And they need the the opportunity. That's right. That's right, Eric. Of which signs should family members, friends, and employers be aware when dealing with reformed persons who suffered from lockup? Well, what you see, and, and as I see, maybe something that's a, a common LinkedIn uh, that I see for people who are engaged or involved in the, I'd like to call them justice-involved individuals. Mm -hmm. I say justice-involved individuals because I'm not just speaking uh, about the people who are currently incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, or waiting to be incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, the, the link then there is what got them in trouble was behavior. Mm -hmm. You can only do what you know. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know any better, you won't do any better. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, that I always, my father used to always talk about was the difference between raised and just getting bigger. Mm, I like so I, that. Yeah, being raised was giving you tools and and things that you need to survive, uh, to matriculate into society, uh, to be a contributor, to be a uh, supporter, mm -hmm. to be a participant mm -hmm. in society, educate the community and the, the, the people on the needs of the returning citizens. Yeah, I, that, uh, that uh, when I said I, I ran the welfare to work program up in Southwest on Fourth Street for a number of years, um, what I started to see was a pattern. Um, at one point, I could look up and see the grandmother, mm -hmm. the mother, and the granddaughter mm -hmm. all sitting there together. Um, which let me understand that this was something that's passed along mm -hmm. um, generationally. That's right. And somewhere along the line, uh, you have to stop it. Right. Um, you know, I, I met people uh, who had never left a 10 block rate in their life. Mm. And, and that's scary that because is. they didn't get to see what it's like in uh, other parts of the city. Mm -hmm. They didn't, you know, sometimes you assimilate. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so true. you are exposed to or co-mingling with. So true. Yes, exactly. Then you start to be able to compare yourself to where you are as opposed to where they are. And innately, we all have pride. And I think deep down in England, we all want to belong and be a part of society that is valued. 
that is contributory. And um, when you don't have those operating in your mindset, then your behavior is askew. Mm -hmm. If I may interject, I'm glad you brought that up because when the animalistic primitive side of a human being, when it gets tired, when it gets depressed or frustrated, it can revert back to the animalistic way of operating. Absolutely. You, this, this disparity breeds that behavior. Yes. Um, you are desperate. Exactly. However, we have to wake up mature and stay awake continuously to transition out of survival mode and step up to the higher life and higher way of thinking. Which leads to the behavioral modification program you established with the federal government. Uh, the mayor at the time, Anthony Williams, approached me and said, Do you think your program would work for returning citizens? And I said, Yes, for all hard to serve populations. Well, they gave me a large sum of money to create a pilot program. Mm -hmm. um, and the pilot program was very successful very uh, to the point where co Congress went to. Uh, take a tour of the facility and uh, the, the warden at the facility and the inmates were raving about the benefits of the program. Oh, and yes. I testified in front of Congress and Congress recommended to CISA that they hired me to come in to kind of help them with the workforce development. And so that's how I got there. Mm -hmm. um, and then interacting with folks and understanding uh, what their needs are. Mm -hmm. and it's my job Key. to go and find vendors and trainers and, and certification uh, programs, which I had already started building at the university. Very necessary program, Eric. So, which activities do you suggest to employers? Yeah, to answer that, um, at first, First of all, you have to have compassion yes. for one another. Yes. Um, compassion will allow you to see what's really in front of you mm -hmm. and what's really needed. Mm -hmm. um, educating employers was a, a task. Uh, most think that is a Herculean task, but it's not. Um, if you do, you approach employers and you are able to do a needs assessment on what that employer needs to grow their business, mm -hmm. um, what they need to increase their bottom line. Um, I think they're open to the opportunity and the possibility of hiring. However, D.C. is such a unique place where we have a glut of talent. We have a glut of people with degrees mm -hmm. um, and certifications and experience. And those are the things that the returning citizen is competing against. That's right. Um, so when you speak to employers, you partly are trying to address what they need as far as their business, mm -hmm. but you're also appealing to them as a human being. That's right. Um, to say, hey, can you give this guy an opportunity? That's right. Um, and I have found a good 80% are willing to do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, in order to help that process along, there had to be some things in place that would uh, help the employer, uh, such as uh, tax incentives. Or hiring, uh, but it also takes the surrounding support services, such as Department of Employment Services, uh, various vendors who do certain training, whether that be life skills, whether that be a trade, uh, carpentry, plumbing, drywall, electricity, mm -hmm. computers. Um, and that's a key point because heretofore, uh, it seems that there's a tendency to uh, focus uh, uh, justice involved individuals to relegate them to certain occupations. 
mm-hmm. such as culinary arts or construction, um, as opposed to society, community, neighborhood, uh, and the powers that be, understanding that here's an opportunity for these individuals to acquire some skills while they have a top captive audience mm-hmm. uh, by being incarcerated uh, to get your, your degree or, or certification in HVAC or carpentry or plumbing or electricity. All of these things you can do, uh, you can be hired to do, mm-hmm. or you can be entrepreneurial mm-hmm. and start your own business. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's a very delicate process of reintegration not only into the community or neighborhood, but a family. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, they're going to have to regain the trust That's right. um, of the family. Uh, you also have to look at the resources of the family. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's a tough balancing act mm-hmm. because you have to address those character issues that that individual possesses. In right. order to alleviate some of the tension and stress and pushback within the family. Right. Operative word, address that, them. Yes. And that's where we had the, so we had the day reporting center. That meant anyone that was under supervision was not currently in training in school or working so that their day would be productive. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a captive audience of people who we could address those issues of mm-hmm. critical thinking, of parenting, of grief, of uh, behavioral modification. Right. Um, and, and that's where you have to start with that individual in order to present them back to their family and neighborhood. Community. Right, instead of just throwing them back to their families and into the workforce. Yeah. What are supporting Nobody, systems? Yeah, I call it polishing the apple. I Nobody's like that. Nobody's going to buy dirty, dirty apples. That's right. But if you polish them, and that polishing is addressing the uh, needs mm-hmm. of that individual um, and giving them a new outlook on uh, life mm-hmm. and, and letting them understand that uh, their life is important. That's right. And fostering inclusion. Mm. So true. So true. Any resources you'd like to share with us? Well, um, in my days uh, before I retired, uh, we had established uh, great working relationships with uh, various uh, federal and local agencies. Um, the, the local agencies like the DOES, Department of Employment Services, um, uh, and, and just as a sidebar to that, when I was younger, the Department of Employment Services was the unemployment office. You could go to the unemployment office, sit down with a counselor. They would pull out a three by five card from a file index. They would call that employer and say, hey, I have Eric sitting here in front of me. He's in need of employment. Um, I see you need someone. And they would. Uh, negotiate and say, okay, so he'll start money. And they would give you the name and address and who to report. The DOS doesn't do that anymore. They have gone to the extreme of servicing people without having the real connection to the employer so that they can pass this person along the continuum of employment. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. Um, You're Department of Employment Services, so you'll get them trained. Um, You will, you know, give them stipends for transportation Mm -hmm. to get back and forth training. However, you don't have the relationship with the back end, Mm -hmm. which is the the employer. Right. Who's who's going to be expected to hire that individual uh, once you have polished that out. And so, Department of Employment Services uh, has a high value, high value. However, that one component of placement of people has been diluted. Um, and, and they have focused on all the other ancillary things that the person needs. 
Then there's the Department of Housing um, because people need housing. Um, they're living on the street, uh, sometimes surfing from couch to couch with friends and relatives um, who themselves are trying to work and are struggling. Um, so, you know, it becomes a, a catch-22 in, in certain instances. You can't kill nothing and won't nothing die. So how do you eat? You know? Um, so we have to start to look at these individuals as a valuable part of society. None of us are perfect. We've all made mistakes. Right. Now, Eric, which activities do you suggest to their family members and friends? Well, um, what I can suggest for the family members and this is kind of hard because uh, D.C. is unique in the fact that we send our uh, residents that have been convicted of crimes all over the country. And that's a big part of what is wrong with that is you've separated them from their family. Uh, most of the families don't, can't afford to drive cross country to California or fly across country all the time to see their loved one who's incarcerated. So there's a big gap there. So and when you talk about what the family needs to do, the family, if possible, needs to let that individual understand that they are loved, they are valued. Whether the storm of criticism and non-inclusion and, and find themselves in a positive place. That's for family. Thank you, Eric, for hanging out with us today. You're so welcome. And I would just like to say to everybody, give somebody a chance. Somebody gave you it. That's right. That's right. Join us next week for the episode, Maintaining Emotional Intelligence, Dealing with Negative People. Remember, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep, keep moving. moving forward. Peace.